for over 60 years, the Land Cruiser name has been growing into a legend. For 60 years, Land Cruisers have been clambering over mountains, crossing impossible waterways, and taming jungles, and arguing with Land Rover about who makes the better vehicle. Now for 2012, the Cruiser has had a facelift. One step below the Prado on the model ladder, the 200 packages Toyota's legendary off-road ability with space, comfort and an impressive spec sheet. The seven-seat, three-ton, 900,000 rand scarer of urban motorists has had changes made front and rear, but sadly has learned no lessons from its FJ Cruiser cousin. For me, the FJ has got the look of a cool, hardcore adventurer, where this has got more the look of a school bus. The whole thing is big and boxy and devoid of anything remotely stylish. It relies on its size to be imposing, but that's about all it's got going for it. On the styling alone, the big 200 leaves me cold, but it has quite a bit inside to try and make up for its, shall we say, lack of exterior interest. Being positioned where it is in the market, it caters to those whose tastes are more five-star bush lodge than two-man tent, so it needs things to boast about. There is a veneer of luxury in here thanks to the sat-nav system and some buttons borrowed from an old Lexus. It's also got things like keyless entry and heated and ventilated seats and a sunroof. But the veneers start to wear off when you see how much plastic there is in here, including fake plastic wood. Here's a tip, Toyota. If you want to use a material in your luxury vehicles that feels and looks like real wood, you know what you should use? Real wood. It really does feel as though, even though this is one of the most expensive Toyotas you can buy, they really haven't put any more than their usual Toyota processors into the interior. Yes, it's got good spec and some impressive technology, but it's let down by the materials and, in some respects, the design. The Land Cruiser 200 has a vast cabin, which scores it points on the practicality scale, but it would score more if they hadn't stuck to their regular Toyota thinking. Join me in the back now so I can show you what I mean. The Cruiser is a seven-seater and they've borrowed the configuration for the last row of seats from the Fortuner. So when the seats are down, it's a normal row, but when the seats go up, they intrude into the boot space, where other manufacturers have very cleverly designed their third row of seats to fit flush into the boot floor. The other problem is that because of this layout, Toyota aren't able to fit a load cover, which means everything in your boot is open to public scrutiny. And that, in security-conscious South Africa, is not a good idea. It may be as big as a warehouse and have four-zone climate control and a 220-volt socket in the boot, but I can't help feeling that it could have been better if Toyota hadn't insisted on borrowing things from other models to fit into what is one of their flagships. Anyway, let's go for a drive. There are two very obvious things about this car once you get going. The first is that it is incredibly comfortable. That goes for the ride setup as well as this interior. The other is that despite the fact that it is the land-based equivalent of a blue whale, it is very easy to use, even in tight spaces. Okay, you might have to do a few more maneuvers than you're used to, but it's all so effortless. Unfortunately, there are some other things that are also quite obvious. The first, and I know this is bordering on sacrilege, is that the V8 petrol powering our test car is not a good idea. It may put out 227 kilowatts and 439 newton meters, but unless you absolutely floor it, this engine almost always feels like it's working really hard to shift this cruiser along. For 30 grand more, you could get a twin turbo V8 diesel with almost 200 newton meters more that can be used where it matters most in this car, low down in the rev range. On top of that, you would get less of a fright every time you glance at the fuel consumption figure. Toyota publish a figure of 10.3 litres per 100 k's, although they don't say if that's the extra urban or combined cycle. But even with our attempts to drive conservatively, we didn't see anything less than 18.5 litres. This is fast shaping up to be not the best Land Cruiser ever made, but fortunately, they've left one thing unchanged. This thing will go anywhere. The off-road ability that's made the cruiser name such a legend is very much a part of this car. Back in the day, it relied on good mechanical setup, but now it's got electronics to help it as well. It's got the multi-terrain system that helps set the car up for different conditions and a set of cameras right the way around the car. So you've got a 360 degree view of the outside of the vehicle.
As an off-road machine, the VX is up there with the best. Its systems are easy to use, so you can concentrate on getting over whatever obstacle is in your path, rather than spend your time trying to figure out which buttons to push in what order. It has enough clearance at both ends to help clear a path, and it has the legacy of Toyota's reliability backing it up. For the price you pay though, I'm not convinced. Toyota want 970,000 Rand for this car. Now put aside your brand loyalty for a second and listen to this argument. For about the same money you could get a Range Rover Sport. You get fewer seats but you get a better drive, particularly in the petrol version. You also get the same off-road ability. But in the Range Rover you get a better sense that your money has been spent on good design and quality materials and that you're driving something special. Whereas this just feels like an oversized average Toyota. The Land Cruiser 200 retains its reputation for all-conquering 4x4 talent, while surprising ease of use and high comfort levels also count amongst its talents. This is a vehicle that provides effortless progress regardless of terrain, but that V8 feels less muscular than the stats suggest, and the price tag means the big cruiser is short on value. <laughs>